How are you doing? Spectator violence, which is why the, the topic for this particular um, mini lecture. And it's one of those interesting things because oftentimes when we when we think about deviance and violence, we, we tend to focus on, and, and rightfully so, athletes, coaches, managers, things like that. But when you look at a lot of these sport violence, not just not just here, but also around the world, what you start to see is the, the role of the, the consumer, the spectator in, in involved in violence and how, how important that becomes. I mean, logistically, um, security and, and security studies um, is a huge part of the sport management industry and realizing how to control, you know, anytime you have like University of Michigan or, or Penn State, Tennessee, places like that, um, USC in the, um, out in the Coliseum and stuff, you're talking about well over a hundred thousand people watching um, a college football game. And there's a lot of potential for bad things to happen there. Um, and so when we start looking at trying to understand research, it's kind of interesting because there's very little research and we just don't know a whole lot about how consuming or watching sports influences um, everyday violence. Uh, there are starting to be some things that come out in terms of consumption of violence, but that's in general and that includes violent movies, video games, and so on and so forth. But there hasn't been a ton of stuff to look at. Um, this understanding of, of consumption and how it relates to you know, everyday activities and interactions. Uh, we do know that spectators at non-contact sports tend to have lower rates of violence and and that's you know when you when you look at spectators at contact sports or these power and performance sports um, they tend to have higher rates of violence but especially here in the United States what we constantly have to do is compare and contrast contrast that with rates today as compared to where they were 50 years ago 100 years ago so on and so forth there's always this great example of a an early um, uh, Major League Baseball game back in the National League and uh, the players refused to come out out of the dugout because the fans were um, discharging their firearms into the air because they were they were upset about some call that an umpire had made. Well, you know, what goes up must come down, so they're worried about going on the outfield and getting hit by, you know, those bullets and, and that kind of thing. So and keeping in mind that it, it, it is relative. Now, you know, recently, as, I mean, as recent as last year, you had... Um, the the violence, I mean, it was politically motivated in charge, but um, in Egypt, with I think 75 people that died at a at a soccer match, um, you talk about hooliganism and things like that around the world. It, it is definitely one of those very very important issues. So, when we talk about fan violence, the irony here is, I mean, the vast majority of violence occurs after. Uh, a uh, basically a win when people get all excited and it kind of relates to some of that collective behaviors research where you get all excited you're tearing down the goalpost and one thing leads to another and there's a sense of um, losing the individual in the crowd and that crowd sort of takes on a life of its own and the mob mentality takes over you know that kind of thing um, surprisingly here in the United States we, we've been fairly lucky um, there's not a ton you know, relatively speaking, not a ton of fan violence. Um, and a lot of that is because, yes, you, you're able to go and attend your sporting events live, but increasingly, a lot of us are watching it on TV, through the internet, on mobile devices, tablet technology is increasing, and so, you know, that's going to influence fan violence and how we understand it in the future. Wakefield and Juan talked about, and I always thought this was kind of interesting, is that, um, you know, we, we want to understand the dysfunctional fan, so let's understand them so that we can do something about it. And that's kind of what you had here. And, the, and these two individuals tend to take things uh, from much more of a psychological point of view, but that still relates to what it is that we're talking about. And so they identify what a dysfunctional fan is, and, and then the dysfunctional fans. And one of the things that they really focused on in this particular um, piece was looking at and trying to understand, identify the dysfunctional fan, identify how that individual within a particular section, how that either exacerbates um, other fan behavior around them or how it's causing problems. And so what they what they want to do is they, they're focused on the safety of the environment. And, and they talk a lot about you know Major League Baseball and, and that kind of things. And again, what's really important for us is you take this psychological or social psychological information that sport managers use all the time 
and they're making recommendations and trying to solve this particular issue. And some of the things that they talk about, um, and you see this a lot even in uh, Major League Baseball right now, is more undercover security, uh, the fan call-in hotlines. Um, this is at... Uh, if you want to talk about Boston Red Sox, they've had really a decent amount of luck with this where they have phone numbers posted and if, you, know, you can call anonymously and report someone who's acting up and then security will come over and, and that kind of thing. Um, Roger Goodell and some of the security measures of the NFL, what he actually do, does himself personally is he and his daughter will attend, um, and they try to get roughly six to eight games a year, which is roughly half the season. And they try to attend different venues throughout the United States so they can get a sense for the, the fan experience. Now, the problem is a lot of venues, facilities, and organizations, it's very complicated when you're talking about putting on, a, for example, a football game because the team doesn't generally own the facility that they're playing in. Uh, they tend to lease it for a certain amount of time. And so then you have like SMG that's actually running the facility. And that's just a, a private organization. And then you may... Uh, Contra subcontract out security and that kind of thing. So it cost becomes something that's extremely important. Now we, we know that the NBA and the NFL both actually have individuals um, that are part of their league structure that serve. Um, they have kind of a police background um, and they're there essentially to um, help develop security strategies not only for the NFL or the NBA in general, uh, player conduct, that kind of things, but also in terms of working with these on the ground security personnel at these particular facilities. So taking a hold of, of spectator violence, realizing that there are ideas out there. Um, Southern Miss, Mississippi University actually has um, an entire center that's devoted to some of this information. And it's basically, it's, it's, for us, it's a nice amalgamation of talking about the sport industry, sport management, and how it relates to a lot of these particular academic ideas.